it's, it's never good to start a, a talk when you've become speechless by a very generous uh, and, and, and uh, a fantastic introduction. And John and Bruce and Terry, uh, I really appreciate the uh, invitation. And I'm going to wander around. Podiums kind of make me feel a little bit hemmed in. Um, so this is just a general sort of overview about what I want to talk to you today. And in reality, uh, many of the scientists in the audience, uh, as much as 20 years ago, would put up a slide like this saying, someday we might be able to have a patient walk in the, in the hospital and, and from that patient make uh, uh, stem cells that are specific to that patient. And maybe someday we can turn those stem cells into, into tissues for that patient to help them therapeutically recover from a, a horrible disease, a degenerative disease. Or maybe we can use that patient's own stem cells and, and, and tissues to screen for drugs that might help them recover from a, from a, from a disease. Because as you know, some drugs work with some patients and not others. However, today, in the last 20 years, this is not something that we would like to do in the future. It's something we're doing today. So today, any of you can walk into the hospital, the medical center, and with just a few drops of blood, we can make stem cells from, from that. And we can now turn those stem cells through tricks in the laboratory. We can coax them to form any different type of tissue, from insulin-producing beta cells, to brain cells, to kidney, to liver, to whatever. And we can use them to try to understand what's wrong, you know, uh, uh, do a diagnostic or screen for drugs, test new drugs on, on the tissues that we grow in the lab uh, first before putting them into you as a patient. And ultimately, and what I'll talk about at the end, we're, uh, we, when I say we, I mean me and a lot of my colleagues in the audience uh, are now using these to uh, uh, develop new therapeutic tissue replacements for diseases. So just a little bit of background about me. This is uh, me working hard in the lab at Stony Brook in grad school. It's just to remind uh, me and, and you all that uh, uh, so one of my most formative research experiences was just down the road from here. And I spent many hours here at Cold Spring Harbor, sometimes doing this, but usually doing, uh, uh, coming out here to listen to the amazing science. And uh, I, I did my thesis research at, with Sid Strickland on, on a, a basic question of, how do cells decide in the body what to do, what to become? If they have a choice between becoming a bone or a muscle cell, how do they make that decision? Um, now, I also had the privilege of having lecturers uh, uh, who, at the time and still, are really the rock stars of genetics and molecular biology. And, and here's just a handful of lectures I had. So imagine you're a student sitting there and, and, and you're waiting for the lecture to show up and in walks Bruce Stillman and you're sitting there and you're like, all right, I better get my game on. It's sort of like if any of you play tennis, it's sort of like you show up at your tennis court for your lesson and, and in walks this person. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's daunting. So I, I'm having a little bit of my graduate student anxiety standing here in front of you because, because of, of, of this. Um, now, after I finished my graduate work, and I became really fascinated by this question, how do cells decide what to do? How do they know what to do? And I, I moved into the next most complicated question around there, and how during devel embryonic development can a, just a ball of cells go on to form an entire embryo and ultimately the, the entirety of the organism? And again, my focus was mostly on the organs of the gastrointestinal tract, including the, the pancreas. So this is something that many of us study. It's still a fundamentally fascinating question, but it also has paved the way for a, a concept that I became interested in when I was a postdoc fellow in Doug Melton's lab in Boston. And that is, could we maybe learn from the embryo who is the master at making organs? Could we maybe learn from the embryo and, and start with stem cells and teach stem cells how to become these organs in the laboratory? So this segues into telling you what are stem cells. Now, stem cells have been around for decades. 
And there are two general flavors of stem cells. There are stem cells that some organs, not all organs, this is important, but some organs, like the blood, the skin, or the intestine, they have their own stem cells, and they do really well at, at making sure those organs stay healthy. Even in a disease case, they're pretty good at repairing the organs. But other, other organs don't have their own stem cells. Pancreas, for example. Uh, beta, when beta cells get killed in people with type 1 diabetes, the body doesn't have a natural stem cell to replace it. So for that reason, I became interested in this other stem cell type. Now, these are called pluripotent stem cells. It's, it's, it's a big word, but all it just means is it, it's exactly how it sounds. Potent, pluri, it means just these are stem cells that can become any cell type of the body. So this is, a, this is just a, a, a little group of, of cells grown in a Petri dish, about 1,000. These cells, when treated and, and pushed in the right direction, can become any of these cell types. So they can become pancreatic beta cells, they can become hepatocytes, they can become brain neurons or, or eye cells. So they're really remarkable. So with this in mind, I, I, and this idea that maybe we could use stem cells to try to replicate some of making organs, um, I started to look around for my own, uh, a place that I might go to start my own laboratory to explore this basic idea that can we turn these these stem cells that we grow in the laboratory into any of these organs in, in, a, in a process that maybe kind of replicates what the embryo does. So with that in mind, I decided to go to Cincinnati. And, and the reason I went to Cincinnati was a number of reasons. First of all, the, this children's hospital has the first pediatric research center in the, in the country. It's been around since 1938. And they really value fundamental research there. But they really value it, they support it They're with a hundred, uh, one and a half million square feet of research space and there's a, over a thousand faculty. But what they also support is, they support the basic research and maybe figuring out ways to use research discoveries to help improve patient care. So basically they cram a bunch of physicians and scientists together in this research foundation and say, go sort it out. You do the basic research, you help us uh, figure out new therapeutics for, for pediatric patients. So since moving there and over the past 20 years, in fact, we have been able to do, honestly, it's beyond my wildest dreams how, how lucky we've been and, and to generate different, different tissues from pluripotent stem cells, all in a Petri dish, all in the laboratory. So now we can turn human pluripotent stem cells into tissues that we call organoids. And again, my focus is more on the gastrointestinal tract, but as I'll mention later, my colleagues in the audience can, can do the same thing, except at the end of the day, they turn these cells into uh, small things that almost are like mini brains, that's what they ca call them, into mini livers, into mini kidneys, mini hearts, all sorts of different mini organoids. Um, so I've mentioned, I've used the word now, the organoid word, what's an organoid? Uh, basically, organoids, just simply put, are miniature versions of, of proper organs. So this is an organoid, a stomach organoid, that is just maybe a, a quarter of an inch or, or a few millimeters in size, and this is a, a, a developing stomach, which will, at the end of the day, in, our, in us, stomachs are, are inches and inches long. But these, these organoids are actually pretty cool in that they can do a lot of the things that the actual organs do. So our, our stomach organoids secrete acid. We can get them to, to, to mix up just like as if they're mixing up food. So they're, they're pretty cool. So here's a, a just a, a fun cartoon movie about how we make organoids in the lab. So at the beginning of this movie, we would control what the cells do just by dumping a bunch of chemicals on them. And these are special chemical cues that tell them exactly what to become. So if we add certain cues, they can become intestine. We add a different set of cues, they become stomach. But at the end of the day, they grow into these things called organoids. Now this is a schematic of an intestinal organoid. But everybody likes to use these movies. Or does it actually actually look like that? So here's what it looks like in the dish. These are a bunch of stem cells that we've pushed towards becoming an intestine. And right about here, you can see one of these early stage organoids just popping out of the dish. And we would scoop those up and continue to grow them, and they can become, again, one of these different organoids. Now, 
this is just uh, an example, uh, and if it, people are like me and they like that British baking show, this is sort of a fully cooked organoid. You know, the one you pull out at the end and, you know, if, if Paul Hollywood were here, I'd be waiting for a handshake. But, um, but what I'm doing here is actually showing you a really thin slice of, of, a, of an organoid, a stomach organoid, and the other picture is a thin slice of an actual human stomach. Now, when I say thin, I mean like when you go to the deli and ask for really thin prosciutto, this is 300 times thinner. Now, but, and I've, we've color-coded what the different tissues are in that or in the stomach. So there's, there's muscle to help you mix the food, there's, there's nerves, and then these are the cells that make the acid. So, um, which one is the human stomach and which one is our engineered organoid? I'm not going to look for a show of hands, I'm just going to tell you the answer. Um, this is a human stomach, this is our organoid. They, they look pretty much similar, but more importantly, our stomach organoids, and again, this is just one example, they secrete acid and they, they, they undergo this sort of mixing motion that we can trigger. And here's actually one doing it right now. This is a, a gastrointestinal organoid that uh, it thinks it's actually part of the, the GI tract and it's trying to mix the food up now. But it's amazing that it actually does pretty much the same thing as the actual organ does. So we can make organoids. Um, Oh, and, and I want to mention, this is to remind me, um, I'm showing you some of the organoids we make. As I mentioned, organoids now come in all flavors. And, and the folks and the scientists in the audience over the past 10 years have generated organ, organoid equivalents of pretty much every organ in your body, with very few exceptions. Brain, heart, liver, kidney, gut, uh, they're all out there. Um, and you can generate organoids, as I mentioned, from those e either types of stem cells. But it, it's really uh, impressive. So now the question is, we have all these organoids. What are we going to do with them? Now, that's where I think I, I've really under-anticipated the utility of these cells. Because how they're being used really is just blowing my mind as well. And, and here are just some examples of how we're using them. I'm going to go through and just give you some examples. So say for, uh, in one case, we had a patient come in into our hospital with a, a congenital malformation of, of their pancreas. And um, that was easy to spot because they largely were missing the pancreas. So anyone could probably spot that, probably even me, and I'm not a clinician. Um, and we made stem cells from that patient because the patient was complaining of other complications. So other gastrointestinal complications, pain and digestive problems and all the different workups that the clini clinicians put the patient through did not discover what the problem was. So we're like, all right, why don't we let the patient rest, stop poking and prodding them, but let's make some stem cells from the patient and do an organoid type diagnostic in the laboratory. So while the patient was, was, was being looked at for, for other things, we thought we'd do a diagnostic and try to figure out what's wrong with the intestine and stomach in there. And what we found, was a bunch of new pathologies that were subtle enough that the pathologists missed them. Um, we validated the fact that they had a pathology in organoid. We went back to the patient, and in fact, they did have that problem. And it the patient had a bunch of problems that I won't go into. But the important thing is we then met with the clinicians and came up with a, an improved clinical plan that the patient is now much better off with their, their complications. And again, those were all discovered using organoids in the laboratory. And again, that's one example. This is being done around the world to look at, patho at new pathologies and discover things across the board from uh, autism spectrum disorder to diabetes to et cetera. So, so organoid diagnostics is one really exciting use that I think we didn't fully appreciate how, how amazing that might be. Uh, another use I want to point out is, is really an area that we, we had hoped these would be useful, and that is uh, drug discovery and, and, and testing, preclinical testing of drugs. Now, as you all know, find, uh, uh, finding drugs that work in humans can be really challenging because you have to start, historically, you start with studying drugs in animals and then maybe other things, uh, and sometimes they work great in animals, but they don't work in humans. So in this case, we can actually start with an array of actual human organ cell types and screen for drugs using that. So for example, in the audience, uh, uh, there are a number of fantastic organoid biologists uh, that have used organoids to test cystic fibrosis drugs. Your, your own Dave Tuvison is using organoids to pre-screen chemotherapeutics 
for, for pancreatic cancer. My colleague Taka Takebi is using organoids to, to discover new uh, drugs for liver disease, etc. cetera. Uh, Christine Mumry is studying or CART organoids to, to uh, try to uh, improve arrhythmias. So hundreds of labs around the world are using organoids to, to screen for drugs and to pre-screen drugs before putting them into patients. Um, my own lab has discovered, we think, a therapeutic for patients who suffer from life-threatening forms of malabsorption. So organoids have really been absolutely transformative when it comes to what we call precision medicine. But lastly, and I think what most of you are, uh, uh, would get most excited about, are cell and tissue therapeutics from, from, from stem cells and organoids. So, this number here represents the number of people just in the U.S. who are waiting for organ transplants. This number here is the number of patients who actually get them. So the shortage of organ cells and organs for transplantation is, is really debilitating for, for tens of thousands of people, again, just in this country. So clearly stem cells and organoids as a renewable source of cells and tissues for transplantation really, I mean, it, does make the hair on the back of my neck stand up for, for that. So for, for years, actually, uh, 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 adult stem cells um, uh, have been developed for decades to, to, uh, to be used as therapeutic. And far and away, the best example and the first example are blood stem cells. And again, um, in the audience behind you are the, the world leading experts at blood stem cells understanding them and using them for therapeutics. Um, however, blood stem cells are great at making blood, but they can't make things like, as I said, pancreatic beta cells or gut tissues, things like that. So that's where these other stem cells, which can become any of these, are, I think have the, are, are emerging as a very exciting source of new cellular therapeutics. So here's one example. Uh, uh, a lot of the, uh, pioneered really from uh, uh, my former postdoctoral advisor, Doug Melton, and that is turning those pluripotent stem cells into insulin producing beta cells to treat people with type 1 diabetes. And this was covered in the New York Times and, and early clinical trials of these stem cell derived beta cells suggest that they may actually transform the, the lives of people with diabetes uh, for their, their ability to, to get them off insulin and, and let them lead normal lives. This is just one example, though. Uh, I did a quick search of clinical trials uh, that use these stem cell-derived cell types. And in fact, there are clinical trials now open and ongoing, not just for diabetes, but for heart disease, Parkinson's. But I, I have to guess that every single person in the audience has a loved one or has had a loved one dealing with this. So this is, this is really, again, it leaves me speechless how far the field has come in the last 20 years. And that the promises we made 20 years ago about please invest in us and we will try to make your lives better, I, I'm happy to report back that we've, we've started to deliver on our promise. Um, so here's one example of a therapeutic that we're working on for really bad cases of, of inflammatory bowel disease where we are attempting to use our intestinal organoids to basically patch up some of these holes that people with inflammatory bowel disease have because if these lesions get really bad, the, the intestine can actually start to, to die or become too stiff or close up and you have to get surgical removal. And eventually if that happens too much, you don't have enough intestine left to absorb nutrients and you have to go on IV nutrition for the rest of your life. And that's the best possible outcome. There are plenty worse. So my colleague, Mike Helmrath, who is a pediatric surgeon by day and, and a, a rat uh, transplanter by night, uh, tested our, uh, these organoids in, a, in an injury model in rat. And this is the upper panel here are, are the organoids that we generate. And these cells are brown because they're no longer rat cells, they're human cells that have gone and repaired a severe damaged bowel in that animal. So this is what we all have to do, these preclinical tests, before we can go take these cells into patients, we have to show that they actually work and cure a disease in an animal model. But so far, so good. Oh. Okay, so I'm gonna finish up the, the 
presentation uh, with some uh, ideas and, and about how we, the field is going to move forward. So I want to remind you that I've said that this has been a journey for many of us over the last 20 years. So turning a basic science discovery into a therapeutic takes time, and we are starting to, to get there, as I just said. Um, one of the big time sinks is, is when we make things in the laboratory, while we do things in a clean way, the Food and Drug Administration needs things in a very clean way. So we have to now transition to therapeutic quality production of stem cells and organoids. Um, so we have to, you know, of course, undergo very important regulatory hurdles to, to make sure that, that cells can be transplantable. Um, we also have to learn how to make more complex organoids to treat more complex diseases. And I wanted to bring up the, the something that scientists actually talk a lot about. You, you know, the, the folks who don't necessarily know scientists personally, you know, probably get a little bit of their impression of what scientists do from, from the movies. And some of that's real. We, we, a lot of us are ab absolute whack jobs, and, and m virtually none of us know how to dress properly. I mean, so a lot of the stereotypes are, are spot on. But one thing that is almost always wrong is that some t movies often portray scientists as like just trying wacky stuff regardless of any ethical implications, and that's not true. I would argue scientists are amongst the most ethical professions, not because we're born that way, but because we self-monitor each other every day. And we make sure that what we say is accurate and what we claim is in fact true. So we actually are all about ethics and ethical considerations around stem cell technologies and organoids. And here are some of the ethical considerations that we talk about on a routine basis that I'd be happy if any of you want any of us to elaborate on them. Please, please ask. So the first one is the cost of cell-based therapeutics. An average uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, a bone marrow transplant in, in our pediatric center might cost a million dollars. All right, so it's not cheap. Uh, and as we generate more stem cell and tissue therapeutics, it's going to be very expensive. How do we pay for it? Who gets it? And who decides you know, what, what is paid for? Um, and because of the cost, there are a lot of unregulated stem cell therapies in other countries. So you've heard of, uh, of uh, what's the term? Uh, the uh, therapeutic tourism, I think, something like that, where people go to other countries to get stem cell therapies. A lot of times they're just getting a, you know, snake oil, as, as the term would go. Um, but then there are, other, there are certain types of therapies that we're thinking about moving forward that involve cell types that we really have to think about. So for example, those stem cells can be turned into, uh, uh, in mouse anyway, they've, they've only done it with mouse stem cells at the moment, but you can turn mouse stem cells into sperm and egg. Now, we haven't done that with human stem cells yet, and you might ask, you know, why should, why should we? But, Working at a pediatric hospital and seeing young kids, particularly uh, young girls, come in who need chemotherapeutic treatment because they have cancer, oftentimes they, they leave the hospital hopefully cured, but infertile. So wouldn't it be great if, 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 they, if we could, in the laboratory, allow them to regain fertility by making their own eggs? So there are a lot of really important reasons why this would be great, but it also raises the idea that if you can make sperm and egg in the laboratory, well, I guess the rest of us are kind of irrelevant for, for the species. So this is a really ethical, ethically important thing that, that we discuss very often. Um, in the news, you may have heard about these human mini-brains. They're not really mini-brains, but they are small brain organoids that are brilliant for studying things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and ADHD. They don't have consciousness, though but they're incredibly useful to, to study the process and, and develop new drugs. And more recently, again, uh, and, and these, are all, these are all things, again, the global experts are sitting behind you. So if you have questions about them, we'll ask, ask the global experts. But one, an emerging concept and, and technology are actually synthetic embryos, where you can start with stem cells get them to come together in a certain way where they actually start to form early stage embryos. And while this has, again, only been done with mouse stem cells, theoretically, it should be possible to do it with humans. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, one reason is 
a lot of people who, are, who have fertility issues are because their embryos just don't make it to the point where they can, they can live. So maybe we could figure out why people are infertile in the laboratory using these synthetic embryos. So there are a lot of good reasons to do it. But again, for any new technology like AI, it can bring great strength, but it's also a, a, a scary new frontier that we have to be careful of and, and talk about honestly. All right, so like I said, the, the experts in all those areas are in the audience. We can ask questions. I, I need to thank my lab. That's really critical. Uh, uh, all the work that I showed from my lab were, were done by these folks in particular, uh, folks like Jason Spence, Jorge Minera, Heather McCauley, who all now have gone off to start their own research laboratories. My, my really great friends and colleagues, Aaron Zorn, my comrade, Taka Takebi, who helped run the or Stem Cell and Organoid Center and, and my funding source. Um, and and I'll, I'll leave with that, that this concept that, that, that started 20 years ago has, is now really fully taken off. And, and we have about 40 faculty now who use organoids to study all sorts of different diseases that impact lots and lots of people. And, and we hope to continue to make progress. And I thank you again, and uh, happy to open it up for discussion.